Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. Lord, it is your word, and you have spoken, you have used men, Father, through the Holy Spirit. You inspired them to write down precisely what you intended, and it has been passed down to us, Father, and you have made sure that we have it today in the way that you intended us to have it. So, Father, I ask that you would help us, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, to be captivated by your word and the things that you have to say to us. Help us to understand it, though, Father. Help us not to take it in the wrong way, but help us to take it in the way that you intended. Help us to take it in context. And, Lord, to that end, we dedicate this time to you. Lord, we dedicate this teaching to you. Ask that you would uh, be with all of our, our hearts and minds. Guide us into truth. Do not guide us into falsehood. Father, give us hope. Give us applications for our lives so that we can do what it is you've commanded us to do. Bless this time, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So this is today just the overview of First John, the book of First John. I'm assuming many of you have probably been through the book before and are somewhat familiar with it, but today I'm going to give you background information that's going to help us all understand the book so much better so that we know it in context. So I did put some pictures up here of John, uh, John the Apostle John. We'll look in, in a moment to see who actually wrote the book. We will find out that it was indeed John. Uh, but here's some, just some pictures from his life. Not actual pictures, but uh, <laughs> artists, maybe this one. But uh, we do have, John was a fisherman in the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Galilee. John and his brother James with their father Zebedee. Here we see the Last Supper, John with great affection. I don't know why they always draw him without a beard. Likely he had a beard. But, what's that? He was young. Cause, yeah, because they're assuming he was he's younger, too young to have a beard, which would be odd. But, uh, he, here he is showing affection to the Lord. And then here he and Peter are, uh, they're actually in trouble. <laughs> this is after, this is in the book of Acts. They are actually taken into captivity and brought before the religious leaders and then uh, uh, flogged and of course threatened. But that did not stop the message at all. And then here we see uh, one of the, the last pictures that we have here is of John on the island of Patmos. He's looking towards heaven and of course getting ready to write uh, the Revelation. He's so, good beard there. yeah, <laughs> nice, nice beard. He's got a pretty good beard over here. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it finally came. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, definitely into his 90s. But I want you to know, first of all, who is teaching you today? And who's going to be teaching you through this lesson, uh, through the whole book? So myself, I'm Jeremy Little. I have been a believer since 1981. Uh, by the grace of God, through the testimony of the uh, Southwest Calvary Baptist Church that I used to attend and getting the gospel over and over again and then having my mother, uh, ha having me ask her all sorts of questions and then she, she explained everything to me because I was upset that Jesus died and then she explained to me that it was my salvation. And so th since 1981 I've been a, a believer and I've been at CBC off and on since 1993, off when I was in college, I wasn't here. I was in Boston, and I lived a time in Nashville. But I came back here, and here I am. I graduated in 2010 from Dallas Theological Seminary with my master's in Christian education. I'm a small group leader, active. Uh, I, I lead the ABF that meets after this class, 2GAB, which is just two guys and a Bible. And uh, I'm a, a teacher as well. But I'm also, a, a, when I'm not doing all that, I'm a real estate agent and investor. Dylan, <coughs> Dylan Hill, this is a, these are little caricatures that uh, the lady at his, his school did. She did a fine job, and he's got a good beard, at least in the picture. Uh, but he's been a believer since the 90s. He also graduated from Dallas Theological with his master's in theology. He's a small group leader, ABF uh, leader, and a teacher. He's a part-time missionary with Crescent Project. And I'm sure he'll tell you more about himself in a couple of weeks when he's here. Uh, Crescent Project does outreach to Muslims that are here locally. And so that's what he's involved in uh, part-time. 
And when he's not doing all of that, he's an elementary music school teacher. Which is really funny because uh, he's a very deep intellectual thinker and whenever he teaches to Gab, he'll, and you'll see what he's like. I cannot imagine him teaching a bunch of elementary school kids. <laughs> he does these silly voices and things. He, he showed me some stuff that he never does in our class, but it's, it's pretty fun. So, and then here's the schedule. Uh, I'm going to teach the introduction and chapter one. Dylan's going to take you through chapter two and three, and I'm going to take you through chapter four and five and, and finish out the book. And we're not taking any breaks in between, so that's going to be for the next six weeks, including this week. So, I love interactive teaching, so at any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, or any comments, for that matter. But now it is your time to answer a question. How do you normally study a book of the Bible? You can answer that. What do you do? What's your approach? Read it over and over and over, just reading it. Yes. Very important. Why is that important? It keeps you to the text. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the study Bible is great, but study Bibles don't, are, don't have inspired notes. Yes. The notes are not inspired. The text is. The Word of God is inspired. So you've got to read it over and over and over again. What else do you do? Pray before you start reading. Pray. Pray is very important. Before you start reading. Because the source of our knowledge, the source of all power is God. And if we try to do it on our own. Every morning I always bring daily bread with the, with the verse. It's great devotional. Yeah, daily bread. So a devotional. It's got the verse and then it's got a devotional to it. It's great. Yeah, small group is fantastic. Small group is, is my favorite, actually, because then you have a chance. Everybody's sitting there working together. Nobody's passive, and everybody's already been in the Bible. So, yeah. Anything else? The smaller group, the smaller books, I write. That helps me. Write them out. Yeah. Uh, Dylan's small group, that's exactly what they do. They're going through the book of Ephesians and he's having them all write it out and they're all writing it out. And that reinforces what you're reading when you actually put the pen to paper. Or if you're typing it out. I think I'd rather write it out. BSF is also great. Yeah, the Bible Study, Bible study Fellowship. Fellowship. Right, yeah. It's non-denominational, but it's, it's very intense. The centrality of the scripture is key over denominations. Right. right. Yeah. The passage this morning on confession is neat. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can illuminate us to understand what the text is. So we need to be in right relationship to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you're, you actually need to be in right relationship. Right. You need to be not practicing sin and living a life of sin and then thinking, well, I can go into the Bible and uh, I'll, I'll have a go at it, and I'm sure I'll get it right. So you have to be right with the Lord. Or hopefully that if you are living in sin like that, and you go to the Bible, that you'll be convicted. <laughs> and then confess. Absolutely. Anything else? Yes? Write down your questions. Questions! Fantastic! Yes. What happens when you write down a question? You think about it, and you have to find the answer. Right. And then the answer puts you on a, a, a detective's work, right? You're trying to figure it out, and which is going to put you in touch with all sorts of different sources. All great things. The most important thing is getting it in context. Understanding God's Word in context if you take it out of context, you can draw the wrong conclusion. If you deviate from the text, from the actual Word of God, you will draw the wrong conclusion. Especially in 1 John. If you don't understand the context of 1 John, you're going to see contradictions that don't exist. Text okay. without context leads to pretext. Text without context leads to pretext. Very well said. So, how are you going to get the context? One way is... What's the history? 
If you read all about the history of what's going on, then you will understand it a little better. You'll understand what the hot button issues were of the day. What's the grammar? Uh, you've got to understand the way that sentences are put together in order to understand it logically. Uh, also, what's the literal meaning? If the text should be taken literal, what's the literal meaning? Or the figurative meaning, if it's figurative. But what does it just plainly mean, just as you read it? Right? I mean, there's certainly symbols are used in God's Word, and uh, especially in the book of Revelation, and in a lot of prophetic work, there are symbols used, right, of the beast with ten heads and that sort of thing. But there's so many other things that it's not figurative, it should be taken quite literally. There's not really much figurative language in 1 John. Uh, geographical. The geography of a region will help you understand better. Uh, people are always, when they're going, even if they're going north from Jerusalem, they're going down to that city because uh, ge spiritually, geographically, Jerusalem's the top of the world. So when people go away from Jerusalem, they're going down. And you'll see that a lot in scripture. And you'll also see a bunch of scholars who say, ah, those fools didn't realize it was actually north. They're not going down to Antioch. Yeah, they are going down to Antioch. Uh, so, culturally, very important. You've got to understand what's going on in the culture. If you don't, you'll, you'll be in the danger of putting today's culture as your lens, as, a, as glasses that you put on. And when you look at the text, you'll look at it through today's culture, which would be, hey Bruce, which would be incorrect to do. What about the rest of Scripture? How does this book fit in with the rest of Scripture. 1 John is very much tied to the Gospel of John, specific chapters in the Gospel of John as well. So you've got to understand the, how does it fit in with the rest of Scripture? Is it something completely new? Is he saying something in a way that looks like what he said previously? And if that's the case, then it's going to mean the same thing. But the Scripture will help you understand Scripture. And then the theology. Is this some new theological idea? Like, uh, it says here that if you're born of God, you're not going to continue to sin. You're not going to sin. Is this some new theological idea that John is going to be putting forth, saying that if you've sinned, then you're not born of God? Or is it fitting in with uh, what he's already established, or what's already been established theologically? And certainly understanding all these other points will help you understand what he's talking about. Applicational. <coughs> How did it apply to the original recipients? And then how does it apply to you today? Uh, the, the context of their application is, is very important. And then we actually have fellowship with them when we understand the things that they went through and then the things that they were being asked to do, especially in this book. Ask questions. Uh, you got great friends here. Who, what, when, where, why, how. These are your best friends when you're looking at the Bible. You ask these questions and you answer these questions. And I do apologize. Some of you probably already know all of this, but I always think it's important just to go back over. Interpret. You answer the questions through interpretation, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit as well. That'd be another good bullet point to put up there to make sure you're in right relationship to God. I can just type it in, yeah. Okay. Format is important because John Lee gives it to you in a legal form. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the genre, the format, the style of uh, what is actually being communicated to you. Uh, interpretation, you've got to understand the text in the context in order to interpret it correctly. If you do not, you're going to interpret it incorrectly. I find it very rewarding in my life to read what the earliest church fathers had to say about the scripture. That'd be the guys from the first to early third century. These guys, I grew up in a Baptist church, and we would never read these guys. They were the, they were the enemy. They were the Roman Catholics. Not one of these guys is Roman Catholic at all. In fact, the uh, disciple of John, Polycarp, went to correct Rome on several issues that they were wrong at. The church in Rome kept wanting to make their traditions become what everyone should do. And Polycarp, the disciple of John himself, said, Hey, look, this is what John handed down to me. I don't care about what you all have decided you're going to do that did not get handed down from an apostle. 
And so he's, he's corrected them. So these guys are great. And I'll, I'll give you more info about them. Yes, sir. Catholics say Peter is the first pope, don't they? They can sure say that, but Peter never said that of himself. <laughs> he was an apostle, period, right? He's an apostle, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Never called the pope. We don't get the idea of popes for hundreds of years. And then they just apply it backwards, retroactively. He crucified up the upside down so he wouldn't copy Christ. That's right, exactly. That's precisely what he did. It's good to read scholarly works, but this is after you've read the Word of God over and over and over again so that you understand it. It's good to see what did the scholars say. It's also good to know that it is not inspired, nor are these guys inspired. Frequently, all you have to do is read some of them. They will say, like if they're writing a letter, Clement writes a letter, uh, he, he writes a letter to the Corinthians, uh, and he was a disciple of, of Paul. And he says, I'm trying to remind you of what Paul said. I am not an apostle, I, which is really interesting because Clement was a pope. But he calls himself not an apostle, and he says that I'm trying to remind you what Paul said. Because what the apostles say is really important. A lot of them say that, you know, I, I am not an apostle. I'm just trying to remind you of what the apostle said and what Jesus said to do. But they give us good context for how did they understand it. And if a lot of these guys are the disciples of the apostles, they, they got to sit under... Wouldn't you love to sit under John? I mean, John lives probably to the year 105 AD. Wouldn't you love to just be, be born and sit under John for 20 years? You know how many, many stories you would get, how many things that aren't written down, and, and, and then understanding what was written down. It'd be, it'd be amazing. Interesting to see his compassion ways with my little children. Yes. Yeah. yeah. About six times, I think. Oh, yeah. Very fatherly. And, and probably the way that he would look at it, too, because he's so much older than they are as well. Uh, Bible software is actually really good. And there's some free ones out there. eSword is free online, and it, and it has all of these guys' writings, actually which is really good. eSword is good, Logos is good, BibleWorks is good. And if you like computers, it's a good way to do it. If you don't like computers, uh, you, you missed out on a real opportunity when we shut down the, or when they shut down the library here at Cypress Bible Church. Somebody wound up getting 200 scholarly works. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a haul, I tell you, and, and I love it. But reading what these guys have to say and people who have spent their lives interacting with it, is, it's worthwhile to read, but it's also worthwhile to keep in mind that they are not inspired. And they make mistakes, especially when they disagree with one another. Uh, so some good Bible companions. Flavius Josephus, I don't know if you've ever read Josephus, but he wrote Antiquities of the Jews and Wars of the Jews. He lived 37 to 100 A.D. He was there when the temple burned in A.D. 70. He's an eyewitness, and he wrote the whole history of the Jews. He was the adopted son of the Roman emperor, and the Roman emperor said, write whatever you want, use all the materials you want to write, or, or want to use, and it was, uh, he, he quoted so many ancient sources that are lost to us now that give us so much better context, and nothing's crazy, nothing crazy. He, he doesn't talk about weird things, but it all helps you understand context, especially the Old Testament and then even uh, the New Testament. Eusebius of Caesarea, the great early church historian. Same kind of thing. This guy is uh, in a, an amazing relationship with Constantine. I'm not crazy about Constantine myself, but I do know that Eusebius had access to things that are lost to us now. He wrote a history of the church from the time of Jesus until his day, uh, which he lived 263 to 339. It's the history of the church. The Anti-Nicene Fathers, edited by Philip Schaff. It's good. It's got the, all those early church fathers that I was talking about. So all of that being said, you, you've got to apply. Once you understand the context, you have to apply. Uh, you you got to apply it to your life, because if you don't, why did you do all that? Just so you could get head knowledge and impress somebody? Knowledge puffs up, right? Now when you apply God's Word, you live righteously. 
And not just, oh, well, I was righteous today. I did it. I'm so happy I did it. No, it's sincere. It's like, no, I, I don't even care if I check it off. I really want, this is who I am. I really want to do this. This kind of thing. So apply it to your life. And when you start applying it to your life, your life, of course, changes. Uh, John's going to be pushing some serious applications, and, and we will get to that here in a moment. So 1 John, the author, the external evidence, which is this, this is again why I say it's good to read these early church fathers. It is so solid that John wrote it. Polycarp is on the record through Eusebius. Polycarp lived 655 to 155. He's a disciple of John. He's on the record, uh, and uh, Eusebius was recording it. Absolutely, John wrote it. The guy that knew John says that John wrote it. It doesn't get much better than that. Papias, who also knew John, said that John wrote it. Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp and was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. Irenaeus says it, and many others say it. John wrote it. Uh, the internal evidence. The book is very similar to the Gospel of John. He uses the same type of words. In fact, it's, it's almost like he's writing an exposition of John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, and, and John chapter 15. So he is expanding on these things that he's talked about before. And it's also true that he uses the word we. So John's use of the word we implies that he's writing as an eyewitness to Christ. He's writing also for the sake of other eyewitnesses, or other eyewitnesses are actually still alive and writing with him. Sort of like uh, Paul wrote letters. We always say Paul wrote this letter or that letter. Paul wrote this letter with Timothy. It'll be Paul and Timothy, that sort of thing. So he doesn't specifically say John, but the external evidence is that it was John. The internal evidence is that it's, it's John. It's absolutely John. And people, you know, there's some scholars today, and, and scholars always want to fight against what is true. Certain scholars, right? Liberal scholars especially. They want to fight against what is true and cast doubt into people's mind about who wrote what. And you know what they typically do is they completely remove history from the equation and they don't believe anything that Eusebius has to say or anything that Polycarp or Irenaeus or any of these guys have to say. They don't care. And they just plunge themselves into great falsehood because of their ignorance. But yet, people listen to them and say, oh, but he's got a PhD. So we should hear him. You cannot trust every scholar. Uh, but John definitely wrote it. That's settled. I, I don't know how, how, it's, how else to say it other than, hey, the guy that was discipled by John said that John <laughs> wrote it. He's definitely going to know that John wrote it. Okay, uh, brief history of John himself. So he was a fisherman. He and his brother James, fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he was nicknamed with his, bro uh, his brother James. They were called the Sons of Thunder. Which is, a, that's, that's quite a, a great name. Jesus gave him that nickname. These guys are, are very zealous. They're the ones who, who wanted to call down, Lord, shall we call down fire on them? And Lord, there was a man casting out demons and using your name, but he wasn't with us. Should we, should we try to stop him? Right? These guys are they're ready to go. Uh, he was at the Mount of Transfiguration. John was there. John, Peter, and James, and Jesus were there. He got to see the glorified Jesus. He not only saw Jesus in the flesh, but he saw him glorified as well. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? Uh, he was a witness after his resurrection. Remember that, that picture that I had over there? of uh, Peter and, and John being taken away, right? He was a witness. After that, he eventually goes to Ephesus. And this is according to the historical uh, tradition, or the historical record, is that he was in Asia, especially in Ephesus. Oh, and there's great stories, too. Uh, there's great stories that are handed down from these guys that talk about John. Amazing stories. Actually, I'd love to share some with you. I will share one in a bit. He was under Domitian, the Emperor Domitian. He was exiled to the island of Patmos for his uh, testimony of Christ. Of course, that's specifically what he says in Revelation 1, that he was there. It happened under Domitian. But he returned to Ephesus after that, 
and that was according to Eusebius and the other early church fathers. And then he died in Ephesus during the, the reign of Emperor Trajan. And Emperor Trajan reigned from 98 to 117 AD. And this was according to Polycarp, Irenaeus, Papias, Eusebius, others. He was the last apostle to die. But he died. He did die. Uh, remember when, when Peter said to Jesus, what about that guy? <laughs> and he was pointing at John. And, and Jesus said, well, what do you care if he lives forever? And, and uh, of course, then John writes in his gospel, he said, well, he's not going to live forever. And it was me, the one that he was talking about. He's not in the tomb there. Either. Who, John? Yeah, he's not in the church of John at Ephesus. He's, he's not in that tomb. You can just look and see. He's not in there? No. His, his bones are not? No. I wonder if they were put all over the Roman Empire and, and worshipped as relics. Maybe burned his foot and sprinkled on the river. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> But he died likely around 105 A.D. He lived to a ripe old age. Um, he was not martyred. Was no. He died of, the only one not martyred. But he died of, of natural causes. All right, so the time and place of writing. This was written after the, his gospel because it assumes that you already know what's in his gospel. The way that he's writing, he's writing, you already know the command of the Lord. In fact, he first introduces to remind them of the command of the Lord, and he doesn't even mention what the command was to love one another until later in the book of 1 John. So he, it's assuming that they already know the particulars of his gospel. He wrote the gospel in his old age. Oh, I'm telling you, you got to read Eusebius. He'll tell you the history of, of everything and when it was written, who wrote it, and, and all those sorts of things. So uh, what Eusebius had received, the, the historical record, is that we already had the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke always record what happened uh, in Jesus' ministry after the death of John the Baptist. They wanted to know, and, and John, the Apostle John, approved of all three of those. Of course, Peter's the one behind the Gospel of Mark, and then Matthew originally wrote it in, in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek. Uh, he wrote his Gospel for the Hebrews. And uh, Luke, of course, wrote his as the historian going around talking to all the eyewitnesses, getting information. But they wanted to know, what about Jesus' ministry before John the Baptist was killed? And so he provided more information. A lot of people say, see, it, it contradicts. None of these stories are in the other Gospels. So the Gospel of John's a fake. It's a fraud. Except for the fact that history tells us precisely why it is that way. And people want to doubt the Word of God, yet the record is there. It's there. Uh, so the, they, but they wanted it uh, to know what happened before John. Uh, the Baptist was killed, of course, and it, this, the epistle of John, 1 John, was written likely in Ephesus around 90 AD before he went to the island of Patmos, so before the book of Revelation. All right, and the original recipients. So John, since he spent so much time in Asia, you know, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, uh, since he spent so much time there, it is likely that it was meant for those churches uh, remember he writes to the seven churches, the book of Revelation. It's likely it, it's also to those. But the only historical record that we have, or that I was able to find, was Augustine, St. Augustine, uh, who lived 354 to 430. He said it was written for the Parthians. Uh, but there was no early church father that, that backs it up. It doesn't really matter, though, because it's a general letter to all churches. The practice was... You get the letter, you copy it down, you make as many copies as you can, and you send them out. Polycarp was a machine for that sort of thing. He made sure that people had plenty of copies of all of these. Copies and copies and copies of the original. No Xerox machines back then. No Gutenberg press. That wasn't going to come until around 1450 AD. So you know it was all done by hand. And, and just so you know, we have so many copies of these scriptures. We have copies from so early. In, there's, there's a great, in the entire New Testament uh, from about the second or third century, complete and intact. Before Muhammad! Oh yeah, of anything. The only one that comes uh, 
The one that comes next would be the Iliad. And I think there's six copies, and they're all about 900 years removed from the original. And yet the scholars want to say that we don't have the real Bible, it's been changed. As if it were a football. The same football being used by many different teams, and now this team has it, and they're going to they're gonna deflate it or, or change the football in any way they want, right? <laughs> so the recipients, though, are second-generation believers. They are the disciples of the apostles, and all of those that are around them. Okay, So you can think of the older generation passing the torch to the younger generation. John making sure that, that the torch is passed. Uh, Jesus and the Apostles warned that false teachers were coming. Okay, so this is now we're going to get into why is he writing what he's writing? Why is John writing what he's writing? There are so many false teachers, false teachers, false prophets, heretics, antichrists out there that the truth needs to be set down so that everybody knows and understands and who better than the man who is with Jesus himself to give this information, to pass this information down. The heretics would always mix a little bit of truth in with their lies. Do they do that today? Yeah. yeah. You know, they're, they're wrong on so many things, but they share the gospel, so maybe they're right. No. Satan also comes as an angel of light, okay? So they mix truth in with their lies, and it always points away from the scripture and points away from the fellowship. They worked their way into congregations to lead members astray so that they could have followers for themselves. Uh, so there was a whole lot of need to combat the false teaching of these guys and, and from this trusted eyewitness source. You're not going... These guys are going to have, these false teachers, these antichrists, are going to have their opinion about Christ, who they never saw in, at all with their own eyes, never dealt with. It's just these newcomers who are going to have their own opinion, and then the guy who actually knows is setting them straight. It's kind of like Polycarp uh, going from uh, Asia into Rome to set them straight. But now we see Rome was victorious uh, the Roman Catholic Church was victorious in their traditions. But we have to be vigilant. They have to be vigilant. Regardless of where these heretics have success and have followers, they're still vigilant in telling the truth. And from the, the most trusted source at that. little background on some of the false teachings that were going around. The idea of dualism. It has roots in Plato's philosophy of, of what is the the ultimate idea, like you think of chair, but there's the ultimate chair, right? You think of table, but there's the ultimate table. Uh, and Egyptian teachings, it comes down to this. Flesh is evil and spirit is good. Nothing of the flesh can be good. Nothing of the spirit can be evil. So flesh is evil, spirit is good. This is false teaching, by the way. Don't accept this. <laughs> Jesus came in the flesh. Exactly. He's combating this idea. Uh, the main responses to dualism, there are two main responses. One, feed the flesh whatever it wants. Live licentiously. Live in debauchery. If you want to eat that, eat that. If you want that woman, take that woman. If you want that thing, take it. Whatever your, your appetite it should be fulfilled. Because the flesh is evil after all. And then the saying is, well, the body wants what it wants. So that's one approach. The other approach is, abuse the flesh. Deny what it wants. Asceticism. Say, no, 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 the, the flesh is evil, the spirit is good. I will not eat. I will not drink. I will whip my body. I will pluck out my beard. I will do all these things. Okay? So I will, I will never have sexual relations again. Okay? These are the sorts of things that some ascetics do. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, the nebulous theology of this dualism is trying to become Gnosticism. Gnosticism is something that comes a little bit later, but these are all forerunners of Gnosticism. But this, this theology that's forming out of this, it's combining with Christianity. It's trying to redefine or deny who God the Father is and what Orthodox theology is. And Orthodox theology, I don't mean 
Eastern Orthodox, I mean that which is correct, the proper biblical theology. It's also trying to separate or confuse Christ the Spirit and Christ the body. It's trying to split them apart. Okay? Flesh is evil, spirit is good. If Christ is good, then he has to be spirit. False teaching. Okay? Uh, spirit bodies that appear to be in the flesh. The idea that there's spirit bodies that are fooling your senses, and it's people walking around, and they're really just spirit bodies, and they're good. And you can become one as well if you're good enough and deny your flesh enough. And they even set up a new pantheon of the gods. It's just paganism repackaged with a Christian label. Okay? That's all, all it is. And then it's, a, oh, the mixture of magic and hidden knowledge. You know the idea that you know they're lying to you. So why don't you come with me and we'll show you the true nature of God. All these churches, are, they're wrong. We will show you the true nature. And they'll mix it with magic. Satanism. Okay? These are the things that John is writing against. These kind of false teachings. Oh yeah, so dualism, you got to understand something. There is a difference between flesh and spirit. But dualism is a mockery of the perfection of God's plan. You know, there... The Hebrews talks a lot about the things on earth are a shadow of those things that actually do exist. Don't get dualism confused with that which is true. Okay, like the, the spiritual tabernacle in heaven in, in Hebrews 8. And what we are now versus what we will be. Okay, There's a, there is a difference. It doesn't make flesh evil and spirit good. Dualism is a perversion of that which is right. But it does work its way into the church, eventually. Uh, you have monks. The monks are born out of asceticism. They go out and they don't share the light. They go into the desert and hide it and starve themselves. And they set up orders, all based on like vows of poverty and those sorts of things. Vows of silence. Vow of silence? When Jesus said, "Go, therefore, go into all the world. You're supposed to make disciples of the nations. How can you do that in the desert in silence? You cannot. All right, so there's this, this kind of nonsense still works its way in here. Uh, but let's talk about some of the origins of it. Simon Magus. He's the Simon the sorcerer from Acts 8. Uh, the one who pretends to become a believer. And he tries to pay the apostles' money so that he can impart the Holy Spirit with the laying on of hands. And Peter rebukes him. He says, you are not right. Your heart is not right with God at all. A lot of the early church fathers record the belief system of Simon and all of those who come after him. Ignatius does uh, a little bit. Justin Martyr definitely does. Irenaeus does so exhaustively. Uh, and then you've got all these heretics in John's day. Simon Magus, Menander, Saturninus, Basilides, Carpocrates, Serinthus, and the Nicolaitans. You remember John wrote about the Nicolaitans in the book of Revelation. So Serinthus. Serinthus is a forerunner of Gnosticism. He was educated in the wisdom of Egypt and the Greeks. And he taught that Jesus was the natural child of Joseph and Mary. Denies the virgin birth. He taught that the Christ Spirit descended on him at baptism in the form of a dove. The Christ Spirit, because Spirit is good, flesh is evil, so the Spirit comes down on him, and the Christ Spirit departed on him before the crucifixion. He's completely got it wrong. Never knew Jesus, but John knew him. In fact, uh, there's a story where John, a polycarp was there, and they are in a bathhouse in Ephesus, and John is in there ready to go take a bath. And then he gets word that Serenthus is in there. <laughs> and he immediately gets up and says, let's get out of here unless the whole building falls on us because Serenthus is such a heretic. <laughs> and so they, they left the building. And that's a story from, from Polycarp. So Serenthus was definitely one of these guys. The uh, Nicolaitans also. Nicolaitans come from one of the first deacons, Nicholas. One of, one of seven deacons, right? Philip was a deacon as well. 
Nicholas focused on asceticism. He, there's a story, a historical record, he offered his beautiful wife to anybody that wanted her as a sign of his commitment to purity. Bad move, bad move. It was misinterpreted and it sent the wrong message. He was an ascetic and it turned into debauchery and licentiousness. Uh, this movement was marked with uh, giving over to any fleshly desire, especially adultery. The idea of swinging and that sort of thing. The Nicolaitans. Okay, a misunderstanding. I mean, this guy, he, he had the wrong message that he was sending. He shouldn't have sent that message and it was probably something he just wanted to show how zealous he was, his commitment to righteousness. He sent the wrong message and then it was completely misinterpreted and turned into this whole nasty movement which the Lord hates. So John says in his uh, opening in, in first, or chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, he's going to testify about what they have touched, seen, and heard. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Okay? So that the readers, because if Jesus didn't die for it, he did not redeem it. Go read Hebrews. The, these Gnostics, these dualists, reject pretty much anything Paul had to write. But they reject Hebrews. Jesus had to die in the flesh to redeem us. This is why these, these guys are so dangerous. Uh, so he's, he's talking about what he's seen. He's an eyewitness. And so that the readers may fellowship with the eyewitnesses. So that the first and second generation may have fellowship together. And the eyewitnesses, that first generation's joy may be complete. How much joy does it give you to see your children and grandchildren walking with the Lord. You can imagine the joy that John had, and he's definitely proud of these people that he's writing to. The joy that he had, and, and the joy that the other eyewitnesses had to say, hey, we're passing this on. Because what happened to the generation that went into Canaan after, after uh, the death of Joshua? What happened to the very next generation? Were they still doing what the Lord had called them to do? They did not know the Lord, is what it says in Judges. That would be heartbreaking. If you're Joshua on your deathbed and you see what's coming down the road, heartbreaking. So their joy is, is to be complete by this. Also, it's to remind them of Jesus' commands, to teach them that which is right, the right theology, so that they don't get mixed in these dualism ideas and to expose the teaching of these antichrists as well so that you can identify it and not be afraid to combat it when it tries to come into your church. He also is trying to command sincere, sincere righteous living, not just righteous living but with the right heart. And to command sincerely loving other believers in action. And here's another little point that he makes, to command believers to love other believers. Another point that he makes is to command believers to love other believers. <laughs> he also makes the point to command believers to love other believers. Over and over and over, throughout the whole book. I mean, he has the letter. He has no problem whatsoever of putting that in there over and over again. Because that's, that's how people know that you are his disciples if you love one another. Jesus' his disciples. Right. Uh, this is a great foundation for the church's defense against these heretics. So the first generation you have the apostles and the other eyewitnesses who are not apostles but were also around and saw it as well. The second generation, the recipients of this kind of letter like Polycarp, Papias, Ignatius, Barnabas, the different Barnabas in the Bible, Mathetes, and then they hand this down to the third generation and these guys are rock solid. This is, the, this is the sweet spot right here. The further you get away from this, the more things change. The more things get added on. You know, as, as the church becomes more prevalent, they want to add new things on and, and that sort of thing. But this is the sweet spot right here, these generations. So what are you hoping to get out of this study?
depth. Yeah. Knowledge. More knowledge. Yeah. Right. That's good. Salvation. Salvation. Okay. Any questions? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, we are excited to get into it and to see every single verse and to go over every single verse of First John. Lord, I ask that you would be with everyone here today. Lord, bless them in their other studies and in their small groups and their personal time. Bless them, Father. Draw them near to you. I thank you for the amazing lives that are before me here, Lord, these wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ and all the things they've done their whole lives. Lord, continue to bless their ministry and all the work that they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.